And so when we talk about edge AI, we talk about putting the computing power out where the sensors are so that we can bring intelligence to see what's happening in the physical world to take you know, real-time action. You might think of NVIDIA as a gaming giant, but its inventive approach to edge computing paired with AI capabilities puts it on the frontier of business innovation. On this episode, Justin Boitano, the VP of EGX, explains how businesses like NVIDIA are helping enterprises harness the speed of edge computing and the added power of AI to improve business efficiency and user experience. Plus, you're not going to believe the incredible time to value or the cost of implementing this at the enterprise level. IT Visionaries is powered by Salesforce Platform and Dreamforce 2022. Catch the news and insights coming out of Dreamforce this year for free on Salesforce Plus. Just visit salesforce.com slash plus. Content will start rolling on September 20th. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have a special guest. His name is Justin Boitano. He's the VP of Edge Computing at NVIDIA. And if you're like me and you've heard of NVIDIA, you know, I don't know too much about the enterprise applications of it, but I do know that's big in gaming, but we're here to learn mostly about its ability to perform at the edge. Justin, welcome to the show. Hey, Albert. Thanks for having us on. Listen, we're pumped. I'm pumped to have you on this show. I think 100% of the market is using it, whether you know it or not, you've probably used something that's being processed and in information through NVIDIA, but I'll let you do the telling. Justin, for our audience that might not be as familiar with NVIDIA, what is the company and what does it do? Yeah, most people, you know, Albert, know us for gaming, consumer gaming. You know, we started, I think, the company in the, the mid-90s focused on gaming. And, you know, over many years, obviously, the company's evolved into being really a high-performance parallel processor that's really great at doing artificial intelligence work. And so all the clouds, all the enterprises now are using AI to, you know, streamline their business, drive business efficiency, and they're doing that on our processors. And that's where we want to talk a lot about, you know, because I took a look at the website and it's pretty cool because it's clearly the company's pushing edge to the forefront. For those who are not familiar with it, let me read exactly what they're talking about. So if you go to the NVIDIA's website and NVIDIA, for those that haven't, don't know how to spell it, it's N-V-I-D-I-A dot com and check it out. You're going to see that they want to talk about going to the edge talk, and it says we want to create a faster, smarter, more connected world. Billions of IoT sensors in retail stores, on city streets, on warehouse floors, in hospitals, are generating massive amounts of data. Tapping into faster insights from that data can mean improved services. What does that mean, Justin? Because this is something that we hear many of our guests talk about, how computing at the edge is going to unlock so much of the future. Give us an idea of what this means. To kind of set this up a little bit, um, and where AI has been really largely adopted is, is in the cloud, right? And so AI is being used to drive uh, recommendation engines and conversational AI assistance. And that's where people interact with it quite a bit. But as you look out towards the edge and you look at most businesses, they interact with their customers, not in the cloud, but you know, in stores. They build products in factories. Cities have to plan for you know, people driving around city streets, right? And in a lot of those edge use cases, people talk about IoT and IoT sensors across you know, many different industries. A lot of the IoT data that's been collected is really, I'll call it kind of like dark data. It gets collected, mm -hmm. nobody knows how to act on it or use it. And so when we talk about edge AI, we talk about putting the computing power out where the sensors are so that we can bring intelligence to see what's happening in the physical world to take you know, real-time action. So to give some you know, practical examples, in retail, for example, we work with many enterprises that want to use AI to look at you know, what's on the shelves and to drive shelf replenishment automatically so shoppers get better you know, shopping experiences. They use it to look at you know, the freshness of produce to know when to restock produce shelves. And then in factories, you know, many enterprises want to use it to drive better quality inspection, you know, make sure they can build better products, run factories faster, and you know, ultimately deliver deliver better better products to their customers. Give us an idea of what this could potentially unlock because I'm sure companies are thinking like, oh, do I need to go edge? Do I need to add a layer of AI to it? When I hear your examples, I think they're super relevant and I think I can picture it. Give us the difference between having just compute at the edge and actually having AI on top of it because like you hinted at it, which is like there's a lot of data, but it might not have insights. Give us the idea of what the difference is and what people could do with one versus the other. Yeah, I mean, I think if you take a very simple case, and I think everybody can identify with this if they've got like a home security system, right? You've got cameras around your house. Something happens outside that you can go back in time and you can look at the video and say, oh my gosh, somebody broke into my car last night but you're not notified in real time that, that, that there's something mm. happening, right? 
And so what AI can do is it can watch the video and it's kind of like a virtual assistant that's watching what's happening in real time. And then immediately tells you like, hey, it's time, you know, it's time to walk out front. Somebody's trying to break into your car is an example a consumer would understand. But, you know, in factories, it's more about, like I said, it's being able to look at the quality of products as they move across the, the production line. It's it helping the people kind of take action when there's there's an issue that needs to be dealt with. Another example of this is in cybersecurity. There might be hundreds of millions of events. It's really impossible for a human to look at all of those events in real time. But AI can look at that and say, OK, Here's the 10 that are most urgent and most critical for you, the person, to go take a look at, you know, to, to prevent, you know, security breaches as well. So when I hear some of those examples you just talked about, I immediately think about what's happening today in a lot of different organizations, whether they're in manufacturing, whether they're in hospitality, there's like a, you know, people keep talking about this labor shortage. And the way you describe it, I think about like how being alerted to what is wrong could potentially move resources to that problem, given, you know, the limited resources so you could better scale or throughput more work or whatever the case may be. Is that how companies are thinking of this? Like how they want to be resource efficient in regards to scale? Is it they're trying to do that on top of being unlocking new ways of doing things? Like give us an idea of, I guess, the push to do this. I feel like the resource constraints we hear about all the time in labor markets is really doing the push, but I'd love to hear how these companies are coming to you guys thinking about how they're going to scale, how what they want to apply this technology towards. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the labor shortage that we see is a big driver of this. And you can think of AI as giving the people that are working there kind of superpowers, right, to do more with less and, and help them, you know, not have to, like we said, uh, in a retail store, walk every aisle to look at what shelves to replenish, but just get notified. The people that you have on staff a bunch of time and it focuses them on where their time basically would drive better customer outcomes, right? I'd say en masse, that's, that's the value of AI. It's helping businesses achieve, you know, better operational efficiency, give their customers a better uh, shopping experience, making sure that, you know, we're delivering higher quality products to our customers, all those good attributes that I think every global brand in the world across every industry ultimately wants to to deliver to their customers. And give me an idea of this advantage that's happening at the edge because you know this has been long thought of as people wanted to move compute there but then like 5G came around and the internet network speeds got faster and so then people start some people said well we can move all the data to the cloud or data center compute it there send the result or the insight after back to the the store in this example. Give us an idea of what this AI at the edge is unlocking. Like, what's the difference? Because there's certainly some people who still think that way, which is, well, I'll just take all the data, move it through the cloud into another data center, figure it out, then come back and send the signal. This is what I want done. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine if you're focused on loss prevention or making sure somebody doesn't walk out of the store with a product that they mm. didn't buy. You need to basically have real-time alerts. You can't wait for the data to be pushed all the way to another data center and then get that notification, you know, back to your store associates. So that's really where we see, you know, edge compute and edge AI kind of being pushed to the edge, right? Is where the, the data volumes are just too big to move to a central location. You know, a store that's running with cameras all over the place and, you know, potentially other sensors, I mean, they're generating terabytes uh, of day of data. And it's, you know, the cost of backhauling all that data to a central location is too high. And like, like we said, you just don't have the instant insights to drive the, the business efficiency. More and more, I think we're going to see the data center transforming. So instead of it being like in a central location where you've got thousands of servers that you bring all the data to, your data center of the future is going to look like, you know, one or two computers in thousands of locations highly distributed. And in those locations, you have to assume like there's no IT staff in a lot of cases. You just can't afford to have IT everywhere. You don't have the same security standards as you have in a data center where you've got, you know, I'll call it guards, gates, and guns is kind of the, the way they typically talk about it. And so all the physical security, how you manage it, all that stuff completely changes as you really kind of move your business into this distributed edge AI intelligence Era. The way you were describing just a second ago, I was thinking about like all the things that need time, like our time constraint. And, you know, you use the security example, and I think that's a great example. And then my mind immediately thought to, well, what about a non nefarious but clearly bothersome bad customer experience, time sensitive event that this potentially could help? And I just, you know, I, my mind keeps defaulting this because I just lost my bags while traveling. We keep hearing about what's happening in Europe with all the baggage loss, but like, you know, this is a serious problem. Like people cannot figure out how to move, like you said, this much throughput of information. It's not, <laughs> something's not working, right? And we only have limited resources. Like this is something that's very much time constrained because 
if Justin, if you and me get on a plane with our bags, that's it. Like it's done. Like we can't solve the problem afterward. <laughs> like, right. Like, our, trip is, our trip is ruined. So we, we need to show up <laughs> with our bags. Yeah. Yeah. So like these, these things are happening for the longest time, all the talk about cloud or moving to the cloud was around cost savings. And then I think people started finding out that it's actually quite expensive or can be expensive to maintain all your infrastructure on the cloud. It sounds like this would require more equipment at the, the locations. Do you see how companies are trying to do cost benefit analysis? Like give us an idea of how they're thinking of this, because with that also comes a layer of security. You kind of mentioned it with People tend, you have to protect the equipment. I don't know if that's a big problem. Give us an idea of where this, you know, how that's weighing in on it, like a modern CIO's decision-making. I think the cloud still is going to play a huge role and everybody talks about mm -hmm. hybrid cloud, right? When it comes to AI workflows, I mean, just to talk about this for a minute is usually where most companies start is the cloud. And they basically start with a labeled data set that they want to be able to look at with AI. And then they train those models in the cloud and then they will ultimately take them and push them out to the edge location so that they can you know, look at the streaming data coming from the sensors. If the model that's running in production isn't able to recognize what's happening in the physical world, it'll still bring data back into the cloud so that you can you know, relabel and retrain the model and then push it back out to the edge store. So you know, for the last decade, I think everybody's talking about like, you know, continuous integration and deployment of software you know, artificial intelligence is the same way. It's the continuous integration and deployment of, you know, AI models. You know, I think the way the CIOs are going to look at it is, you know, there's there's still my, I'll call it my core data scientists and my core AI researchers that are going to want to work in the cloud to be able to train the models, you know, prove that they're viable. And then when I move them to production, I, I push that model out to the compute that's at the edge. And so, you know, I think edge complements the cloud in that case, right? And you kind of you use the, uh, the compute that's near the sensors at the edge. You bring back, you know, new training data sets uh, into your core data center. So your data scientists have access to it. And then that, you know, continuous loop basically repeats itself as you drive more and more business efficiency. My old world thinking, uh, I served as a CIO for companies. And whenever I would hear new innovations, I always start, my mind would be like, well, how is this going to be maintained? Because of course, if this is AI, it's got to constantly be updated. It's got to constantly be given the best models, the best data, the most accurate results. And it also needs a feedback loop, which is I need to be able as a consumer of your product, have to be able to send a response to say like, hey, that wasn't right or that was wrong. Something that helps teach the model even more information so it becomes more accurate. But the way you described it there, it sounds like this is how you guys are in, it's engineered to continuously evolve. Give us an idea of like how you and your team are approaching building these. I keep saying machine, but I don't know if you guys are like, it's actually it's not that big of a machine. It's like a small little blade that you put in on a rack. Yeah, yeah. these we call them Jetson processors, right? They're ARM based processors with embedded GPUs and they're tens of Watts, right? They can run out at the edge and look at cameras from there all the way up to, you know, rack levels of servers, depending on how many cameras you're trying to look at. But you know, the server's one aspect, there's kind of I'll say three or four layers of technology, right? The way we looked at it is, okay, the transformation that's going on is you're basically running servers really in what you traditionally think of as your OT footprint. And the IT team need to make it easier to deploy and manage that infrastructure in the OT environment. So where we started was, okay, let's make sure that anybody can take a server off the shelf, plug it into power networking in the store, authenticate it into the cloud service, you know, just like you would do with a, a Nest setting it up in your house, and then all the software, you know, and all the security automatically kind of gets installed on that, that edge device. And then through the cloud platform, kind of your central IT resources can remotely see what's going on, remotely debug it, deploy applications in a secure way, deploy models in a secure way, kind of, you know, obviously see what's happening in all of these, these edge locations and be able to push, you know, over the air updates, right, from the operating system up to the applications and up to the models. And so that, that platform that we've built is kind of a, we'll call it a reference platform that we call Fleet Command. It's a cloud service, and we offer that, you know, through other, I could say, software licenses to help people get started. You know, some enterprises want to consume, I'll say, turnkey services like that. Others may, may have their own, you know, infrastructure footprint. And by infrastructure, I mean their traditional IT tools with partners like VMware, our partners with Red Hat, you know, we we work with them too to bring all the, I'll say, foundational innovations of Fleet Command into those other platforms, so that we can, you know, make it easy to deploy AI applications at the edge, manage them securely, and kind of manage them at scale. Give me an idea of how long time to value to train the models, because that's one of the things I always think about too. Is in like again, I'm putting my old CIO hat because I would hear pitch and I'd be like, "Oh, how long does it take? And how long does it maintain?" Give us an idea, of, like, because I know model training has gotten 
exponentially better. It took a lot longer for Google Photos to figure out what a dog looks like than what probably you guys are doing now. But give us an idea of how much user input, how much company input is there to train that model so it can start delivering, like you said, a lot of value to their customer experience, whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, to make this like as easy as possible for enterprises to get going, we have a suite of software that we call NVIDIA AI Enterprise. And within NVIDIA AI Enterprise, we deliver some foundational tools, one called Tau, which helps you basically train and adapt a model to your own environment. And we offer pre-trained models. So you can basically take mm. our pre-trained models, you can take your own you know, in-store data sets, and you can you know, retrain the model and get you know, really fast, you know, you said time to value, right, of applying models uh, in, in production that way. And then, you know, I think people are doing a lot of POCs through model tuning in that fashion to prove the business value and then, you know, maybe make the investment in kind of building their own specialized AI teams. But, you know, ultimately these projects, I'd say if you're doing loss prevention in a store, as an example, the cost savings will pay for itself, pay for the infrastructure in under a month. And so the rest of wow. it is just taking money to the bottom line. One month time, the value is pretty substantial. So, I mean, that's pretty darn good. When you think about you know the use cases, that was that's one of them, the being able to recognize loss prevention. And it's not your fault. It's no one's fault. But like AI in general, that term has been used so much as has Edge that people can't quite under, like when you say AI, they're like, I don't quite know what you're saying. I know it's someone thinking for me. Edge just means, hey, processing faster, closer to me versus data center. Give us an idea of some of the other use cases that you guys have already seen, because that's a big thing. If you're telling me that within one month of me installing this equipment on my retail footprint, that I've already stopped more theft than the cost of the machine, this is brilliant. I would install it everywhere, right? <laughs> like the, the, yeah. the, give, us some, give us some other examples, because this is this is where it gets really cool. And I think that's why we're seeing kind of this accelerated growth, and, and we think it's going to be you know at least a 10-year journey, right, for people to take a lot of the AI innovation that's happened in the cloud and bring it out to, to the physical infrastructure where people actually you know, interact with, with most of their customers in, in retail and manufacturing and, and the like. And so some other examples, so we have, we call them you know, frameworks, like application frameworks to help people get started with, we call it vision AI, which, which can be applied in all these use cases that we've primarily talk, been talking about at the edge. We have frameworks for doing conversational AI. So if you wanna have you know, virtual assistants in stores and those virtual assistants can blend, you know, vision and voice. So a perfect example is, you know, I go, I don't know about you, but on the weekends, I end up doing a bunch of homework, like uh, work on my house and I might tear <laughs> something apart and I walk into a hardware store with a part and I've got to find a human and say, Hey, what is this thing? Where do I find it in the store? Um, well, yeah. AI can look at that and it can tell you, you know, that's on aisle 12. So we're starting to see type virtual assistants that can blend voice and vision, you know, to, to help direct consumers into new locations. And that application framework that, that is kind of the foundation of that, we call Riva is the application framework for that. We have other application frameworks for cybersecurity. It's called Morpheus. It can look at the packets on the network, or it can look at, uh, say, login events of, of people within your enterprise, and then basically build behavioral profiles of those people and the applications that they might be interacting with across your enterprise and be able to tell you when the behavior changes, which could indicate compromised credentials. So the security oh. side of enterprises, you know, there's just not enough security people in the world and the cybersecurity threats to enterprises keeps growing exponentially. And so the more that we can move to the zero trust architecture where we are kind of like watching through AI, what all the people are doing on the network, you can, you can quickly kind of flag and see when, when bad actors arise. So that's, that's another framework. We've got frameworks for recommendation engines. And when we talk about these frameworks, like some of them, I mean, they can run at the edge, they can run in the core, but I think these are just kind of common use cases of AI that we're seeing across enterprises. And so more and more where we're spending our time is really creating these, I'll call it, you know, blueprints that basically are these, these reference applications of AI that any enterprise can take, they can you know, apply to their infrastructure to start seeing some of this business value. You hit something in just a moment ago that I wanna explore some more, which is that you mentioned this, like if we're very early in possibly a 10 year journey for adoption. I'm curious when you meet the new customers or new businesses that are going down this venture, or maybe they already use Edge AI, what types of problems, I guess, are they bringing to you and saying like, hey, could this solve this problem? I'm sure that's like all kinds of different problems. I'd love to hear like what your perspective is. It's like, do you think people are thinking, what are they thinking about? Is it typically in security loss prevention? And I got it and I'll add a tag on question, which is like, has any of these ideas like stumped you? Like, I don't know how I would solve that, <laughs> you know? 
Well, the, the reality is, I mean, another one, just to go back to like other use cases, another one is like fraud prevention in like, you know, financial services mm. and trying to look at all the credit card transactions and find the, you know, the outliers, right? Like what is the fraud and how do you, you address it? But, you know, what we're, what we're seeing more is I, I think every business under now understands, okay, AI is this, you know, transformational force that can really help me drive business efficiency. But, you know, what they come to us with is, how do I get started? To be honest, it's how do I get started? And, you know, the recommendation is always like, let's identify really kind of a short term, high value, you know, business problem. And then let's build a POC around that and basically help you, you know, realize a quick success. And then these projects, it's like they can touch many different aspects of the business. If you take like customer service, customer support, it can touch kind of core, like transaction processing, it can touch the store footprint, it can touch, you know, many, many different aspects. So I think you know, our general advice is let's, let's choose one, let's choose a high value one. And then let's like share with them the blueprints of success that we see across their industry so that they're not out, you know, trying to pioneer something that's that completely novel research on their own, but they can kind of apply the best practices and, and kind of get those, those quick short-term wins. That's a great way to frame where we are in this journey. Is I ask, like, are they throwing out groundbreaking innovations, which I'm sure some people are asking crazy requests. And then you're saying the bulk of people just like, hey, I just want to get started because I know this is going to be a transformational thing. I, I need a little help and guidance how to get this implemented. You know, you er, we also talked earlier about it, the levels of security. How do you envision or how does NVIDIA, how do you and your team think about securing this this product? Because it is so powerful. It is if you're telling me it's actively in real time helping me make business decisions, actions, whether it's in security or loss prevention, like if I was a security guard, I'd have to actively go possibly stop somebody. Like it, obviously it can't have false positives. There has to be accurate. And if it's connected to the network, which it is, it's also can be hacked. And so like it's got to be protected because otherwise who knows what could happen. How are you guys approaching security to keep this information and the information that the business data, the customer data, personal privacy data, all of it's got to be secured somehow. Give us that idea how you're approaching security. It's a, a full stack problem, you know, from silicon to firmware to operating system, you know, to applications and then, you know, system level, right? We're, we're looking at it holistically. And I think, you know, we're going to continue to drive innovation kind of through that full stack. The hardware level, you know, recently we, we've introduced new hardware capabilities. We launched our hopper architecture and our hopper architecture is going to support what we call confidential computing. So it effectively encrypts the link between the GPU and the CPU so that the AI model is encrypted in transit. It's encrypted you know, at rest and it's encrypted in use now, which is super important so that you, even if people have physical access to the system, they can't, you know, steal that intellectual property or like you said, kind of tamper with the AI to, to drive, uh, you know, to, to fake out basically the computer or to fake out this, uh, the people that yeah. were in the alert. Yeah. And so you've got to protect that AI model. It becomes super critical intellectual property for the companies. I mean, when we're working with these companies, I mean, effectively you end up spending, you know, over, over many years, like millions of dollars to codify data into these AI models. And so the AI model itself becomes your critical intellectual property that you really have to protect when you deploy out there at the edge. It starts at hardware, but we're working through the ecosystem. So other things that we've been doing is we've open sourced our kernel mode driver for GPUs. And we've done that so that we can work with OS companies to sign the driver to make sure that you know, it is our driver, it is kind of protecting their data, and basically that, that driver is exposing all the right APIs even up to the application level. So basically, we, we have to kind of replumb the whole stack to make sure that it's secure, right? I mean, this is the investment that everybody's making is, is in AI. We got we to gotta help them protect it the ways that we can. No doubt about it, man. I always think about when I see movies like any type of stealing movie, right? Like, <laughs> Ocean's Eleven or whatever, and how easy it is from the hack systems. Like that cannot be true. Like this is <laughs> this has the, the the things that you guys are probably going through to make sure that no one none of this stuff gets compromised is pretty darn intense. The the challenge is a lot of enterprise IT organizations they want to go I'd say piece together a bunch of vendors to build these kind of mm. bespoke architectures. And that's why like, you know, the the platform that we created called Fleet Command, like we said, okay, you know, the more you can vertically integrate the, the entire stack all the way up to the cloud service and the fact that we're operating it, we can then have our security teams do the penetration testing on the full stack, have kind of alerting on the security health of the entire architecture and then provide that as a unified dashboard back to IT teams just so that they don't have to build these intelligence, you know, community level 
apparatuses around security themselves. They can kind of harness and take advantage of kind of the teams that are being built. Uh, companies like NVIDIA, you know, or or clouds, right, for, for going and deploying the infrastructure and getting the benefit of their security teams. Well, listen, this has been an enlightening conversation because prior to us getting this interview on the docket, I, like you said, I thought of NVIDIA as a gaming company. I thought it made chips, components, and possibly hardware, but it's a software company. It's a services company. It's, it, it, it's, it's very multifaceted. And you've kind of hinted at that you guys build the component services, software, and products and hardware around not only the core AI, but also the security around. I mean, it's pretty, pretty darn cool. Were you always into AI? Were you into hardware? Like, give us a little bit about your background. What were you most interested in, let's say, 10 years ago? <laughs> Oh, no, I joined actually like 14 years ago in like 2008. But what's what's funny is my undergraduate degree was in computer science just because, I, you know, you realize the tech industry is taking off and it's an interesting sure. area. But my, my studies were in communication networks. And then I started my master's in computer science. And one of the first courses I took was in artificial intelligence. And at the time, I had no idea. You know, it was all theoretical. Like I had no idea how it would apply in real life. So about 10 years ago when I joined NVIDIA, you know, we were just kind of reinventing ourselves. We'd, we'd gone through, I'd say, three big evolutions as a company. First, we were a graphics processor company. And when the company started, it was just offloading, they call it tessellation and lighting for graphics applications. And it's for gaming apps and, and for 3D design applications. But we reinvented the, the platform when we realized we created something called programmable shaders and GPUs for graphics, you know, just to make sure lighting effects look more realistic in scenes. And we saw researchers starting to use those programmable shaders to do parallel computing and, and accelerate high performance computing in supercomputers. So we created a technology called CUDA. CUDA was just being born basically when I joined NVIDIA. You know, you kind of have this intuition that, you know, having a parallel processor is going to solve some of the world's biggest challenges uh, as it was going into supercomputing. We weren't exactly sure which ones. And then in about eight years ago with the creation of AlexNet, it's like we, we realized, you know, AI was the life-changing workload that's going to affect every industry. And so I came out of the computer science world and was just fascinated with the technology. And, and like you said, it's kind of a gamer at heart. Plus, you know, wanted to see kind of the business use cases of high-performance computing and then, you know, landed in video. The thought of AI has been a subject in movies well long before it's starting to come to real life right now. Were you always interested in that element? Like, could it, could we possibly teach a computer to help us think for us? Was that something that inspired you to say go down the path of AI, or what was it that made you say, "Hey, this is now the new the new segment I want to go down"? I never thought that there would be enough compute power to realize the the theoretical benefits of AI. Right? I mean, this is yeah. when I was in school years ago, and so when you're early in your career, you haven't like seen enough of the evolution of technology or business problems. You don't know if like what you're studying is so academic it's never going to be used. Right? But that's where I originally was. Coming to NVIDIA, though, you, you start to realize, like, you know, AI is transforming healthcare. It's transforming self-driving cars and automotive. It's transforming, you know, how the cloud companies are delivering services to customers with, you know, through recommendation and conversational services. And now it's really starting to, you know, impact, I'd say, store footprints, manufacturing and retail and, and you know, smart cities. And then in the future, it's also going to impact the ability to, to create robots, right, that can navigate the world yeah. and, and can help with shelf replenishment and stuff in stores. So I think right now it's just like a, it's like a playground of amazing technology. And, you know, every day you kind of wake up and you hear of a new business problem solved with artificial intelligence, and it just kind of keeps motivating you and the team really to keep moving forward. Plus, I'll say NVIDIA's got like some of the smartest people in the world, and that, that's always pretty inspiring as well. Listen, you hit on a couple categories that I, I definitely agree 100% with. One of the categories you hit on was healthcare. And every person on earth has also consumed healthcare in some way, and I think it's scary to think about how much human error and judgment is actually involved in the diagnosis of healthcare. I agree with you 100%. As AI improves, this ability to have less false positives, I mean, it's going to dramatically change people's lives. I mean, dramatically, like they talk about like early cancer detection. Like, can you imagine a place where, you know, something not visible to the naked eye is now able to be detected and doctor be like with certain certainty, like, hey, we need to go through treatment now. I mean, we're talking about extending years of life and it seems to be happening very fast. And a lot of things that you hit on that I think a lot of our audience cannot wait for, for it to all come true. I mean, we all kind of have those personal stories where somebody gets an opinion and it, and it may or may not be accurate, right? And so like to the extent that you can get a virtual second opinion in real time, it's, it's like you say, codifying some of the, the world's best intelligence into an AI model just as a second check is, you know, saves potentially people a lot of heartache later on. So I, I, those are the types of things I'm 
I'm super excited to see kind of come to fruition. And we're starting to see it in, you know, we've got another framework. Uh, we keep talking about these application frameworks that we call NVIDIA Clara, and it delivers exactly that to like radiologists. It helps. Mm. There's more radiology images than like, you know, actually radiologists to go look at those images. And so having AI, let's say triage those images, and then basically have the doctors look at the ones that, you know, look like they need, they need to be looked at sooner can obviously help get people better treatment faster. And so it's, it really is going to kind of change the, the, the course of medicine for, for people all over the world. I can totally see that happening. I think we've all been there where the, the test is done, yet we wait in the waiting room for the result. Everyone's been there. Every one of us has been there. And it's like, whoa. <laughs> and just for them to become like, hey, Justin, you can go home. It's like, I would have liked to know that like two hours ago. <laughs> Well, Justin, it was awesome having you on the show. Thanks for sharing what you're up to at NVIDIA. Thanks for clarifying and kind of giving us some examples of what Edge AI can unlock and potentially unlock for us in the future. And I agree with you. We're just starting the journey. I think that's exciting because I feel like progress, so much progress is being made. But like you said, so many companies are just learning how to do it. What's going to be unlocked in the future? Who knows? I think the you know there's really limitless capability, especially given like the fact that these tools and models learn and you guys are going to constantly be keep improving. But before you go, it is time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to us by Salesforce platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Justin, this is where we ask you questions outside of the realm of work. So our audience could get to know you a little bit better. Uh, some of the questions involve a little bit of work, but are you ready to go? Yeah, let's do it. All right. What do you like to do for fun? You mentioned gaming earlier. Are you still a gamer? I, I game with my kids now, right? So my kids are six and a half and it's like Roblox. It's Roblox on tablets. You know, I spend more of my personal time doing stuff outside. So now it's skiing and sailing is where I like to spend my personal time. Oh, nice. Skiing and sailing. So typically, where do you go to ski? Where do you go to sail? We're trying to figure out where you, where people, are the places people you can like probably tell from my background because it looks like a cabin. I'm I'm actually up in uh, Tahoe right now, so I spend a bunch of time kind of at the at all the local resorts. So like at you know North Star Squaw Sugar Bowl, you know my kids. You know I'm getting to the point where it's like my kids can out ski me, right? So I'm just trying to keep pace with them. And they're that. six and a half. Yeah. <laughs> So you said they and only gave out one age. I guess you have twins? I got twin girls. Yeah. I got twin girls that keep me honest. So yeah. So and they're awesome. already faster than you on skis? They are. The kids do mighty mites, you know, they kind of just bomb down the hill with a like a big snow plow and they like, you know, blow past everybody. So I guess at that age, you're so close to the ground, you can't get hurt. No, I can relate. I remember going skiing with my sick, at the time he was six and I was like, I don't know what's happening because this kid is bombing hills as you just described. When you are skiing and sailing, I got to ask, do you think about work or where do you, if not, where do you go to try to like solve problems? Because we found that this is always a fun one. I feel like every time you can really clear your head is like when you end up with like all these insights into you know, new ways to solve business problems, right? So like I, the other thing I do is I, I kind of go running or mountain biking in the morning every day, right? And so that moment of clarity or the, you know, hour of clarity of like getting that workout in also helps you kind of clear your head and, and come up with innovative, you know, solutions to whatever problems are, I think, nagging you, right? To keep you up at night. No doubt. Listen, you're a really active guy. You running or mountain biking every morning, skiing or sailing for hobbies. I mean, you're an active guy. Justin, I want to say thank you for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Thanks for sharing what NVIDIA is all about and what it's up to. And thanks for sharing a little bit of insight into how you clear your mind, how you think. It was awesome having you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having us, Albert. It was awesome talking to you. Hey, thanks for watching. Subscribe to this channel for more great IT thought leadership. And thanks to our partners at Salesforce Platform for making this show possible. Go to salesforce.com newsletter to discover timely insights and useful tips tailored to your role.